Wow, I am excited about this key note address, and it's my pleasure to introduce Kelly Munns uh, to um, you this morning. Kelly is a lead lecturer and Eng and English equestrian team coach at the Equine Science Center. Her teaching career began in science, ed, uh, science education for secondary public schools, where she developed expertise in mastery learning, curriculum, map, uh, curriculum mapping, reliable assessment design, leadership in professional learning communities, and formative data analysis. At USU, she has applied these principles to the equine program, mapping course and program curriculum based, on, based upon established outcomes and incorporating mastery learning principles. Would you please welcome Kelly Munns to the, pod to the podium. everyone is this on can you guys hear that okay okay um, so good morning I'm really excited to be here um, and very humbled to be the keynote speaker today and I hope at the end of our time together that you guys feel challenged or validated by your notions on how your instruction influences student learning so student learning if we want to pull that up so student learning whose responsibility is it That's a good question. Is it all just on our students? And I know coming from secondary education, K through 12, I've heard multiple high school teachers tell students, you're gonna get to college and it's not gonna matter, they're not gonna care. Is that what happens here? Well, let's find out, because I'm gonna give you some insights on my feeling on that. So, in your guys' uh, bags, you received a notebook with a pen on it. So I would like you guys to grab this and pull it out and pull your pen because we're going to answer a question. And the response I want is to this question, what is your course's ultimate learning objective? So I'm going to give you guys about 60 seconds and I want you to write down the answer to that. Pick one of them. You might teach multiple courses. So pick one course and respond, what is the ultimate learning objective you have for it? 60 seconds. Okay, so now what I wanna do is give you another 60 seconds and I want you to share your learning objective with your table. So pick one person and then move clockwise from that person. 60 seconds, share with your neighbors, go. Oh, everybody's talking, good. <laughs> So this is really exciting. I love that I can hear this much conversation going on, talking about our learning objectives of our courses, right? Uh, what I did before I came up is, as you guys were coming in and registering for this, is I asked a few of our colleagues to do the same thing so I can repeat them to you guys. So I have Joan from the math, the math department, and her course learning objective was to review or learn math skills to qualify for the next level of math, learn basic algebra skills. Pretty good. I have Sarah from the music department, uh, her music 1100 course. Students will become familiar with music notation evaluated through four original compositions. It's really good. And I have Dr. Hoops from the ADVS department, his equine nutrition and exercise physiology course. Students will gain an understanding of equine nutrition, anatomy, nutritional needs, exercise physiology, and muscle function. And I'm sure you guys heard really, really good learning objectives from your colleagues sitting at the table. Um, and I do not doubt here at USU or anybody that comes into education doesn't have a really high expectation of what they want their students to learn in their course. So here's my challenge. Oh, can we pull that up <laughs> so you guys can know? How do you know that your instruction is meeting the learning objective you have for your students? So you just laid it out there. You told your table, what is your learning objective? 
How is your instruction meeting that need? Some of you may be able to tell me, call on me, Kelly, I can tell you right now. And some of you may say, I, they passed, they didn't have to retake the course, so obviously they learned something. They must have gone, gotten close to learning that objective. And maybe some of you have no idea. I, I don't really know. I feel like I know, but I really don't know if my instruction's meeting that need. So that's what I'm going to take you through today is answering that question. So one of the things I do is I run through a process. So if I'm asked to teach a course or a topic, including when I was given kind of a topic for this speech, um, is I think of what is my big picture? And that's essentially what you guys just did, right? What is the ultimate learning objective? What's the big picture? From there, I actually start to think about, number two, my big ideas. So what do I actually need to do with this course? What are the big concepts? Uh, we read Dr. Hoops's. Um, objective for his course, and one of my courses actually feed into Dr. Hoops's course, and so his unit on uh, feeds and nutrition is going to look a little bit different than my unit on feeds and nutrition, but it is one of the concepts I need to touch on, and it's a big concept. So once I decide what my big concepts are, then I go to number three, the details. And the details are the essential learning outcomes that I want my students to know. They're very, very specific. They're the nitty-gritty of what I want a student to get out of my course. Okay, the very specific idea I'm trying to touch on. Number four, check for learning. So I know what I, I, know what I want my students to know. So how am I going to know that they know it? And that's going to be my assessment. And assessments vary, right? There's all different types of assessments out there, including myself. I use various types of assessments in my course. It's not always just a multiple choice assessment. And then the last thing I do is I then think about my instruction. So I know what I want my students to learn. I know how I'm going to know if they've learned it. Now I connect it through my instruction. So do I need a PowerPoint? Is there an activity? Is there a lab? What do I need to do with it? What is my instruction? The other underlying principle when it comes to education, and it's one of those things I can't really teach you, but it is something that you should learn. And it's your enthusiasm and your relationships with your students. And I call it the ER factor. I remember we were doing SAGE testing, which is, if you're not familiar with K through 12, or you don't have students in K through 12, uh, you have a big state test at the end of the year. And for certain subjects, not all subjects do it, but we had a big one for science. And I always seem to get students to test really well on it. And the thing is, it has no accountability to the students. The students, you can't give them a grade for that. Um, you cannot give them an assignment if they test out of it and they decide to not do the SAGE test. It really is all about teacher accountability. And so basically it's the state's way of saying, are our teachers doing what we want our teachers to do? Or are they teaching the students what we want them to teach? And I would tell the students that. I was very honest about it. And I said, hey, this is about me. This is about proving to the state that I'm teaching you what I want to teach you and what you need to know. So just give me 100% on that. I would appreciate that. And I could pretty much get most of my students to try really hard. And a lot of it had to do with the relationships I created with them. Now, I realize some of you guys teach very large courses. You may even teach an online course. And you're like, how am I going to develop a relationship with my students? I don't even see them face to face. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with your students. It doesn't mean that you go to every single, single student and have a discussion with them. It really comes down to your efforts. And so students can tell how you feel about their learning by the effort you put into your instruction and course. If you don't show you care, why should they? And students can tell. And so it's really important Again, I can't necessarily teach this to you guys, but it is something you should learn, or at least you should ask yourself, do I have an ER factor? Do I show up with a desire to teach, with an enthusiasm to be there? Because you can do everything perfect, but if you don't have that, I promise there's a disconnect with your students. Should they care if you don't show that you care? Okay, so just kind of a little sidebar there. So... Where lies the responsibility, right? That's the whole point I came back to. Whose responsibility is student learning? And then why am I so important that I'm talking about it up here? So what do I do about this? And I want to back up to the process that I talked about, number three, number four, and number five. And I'm going to show you how I develop one responsibility and two accountability in instruction with my students' learning. 
Um, on your guys' tables, you guys have a plicker card. And basically, this is going to be an assessment tool. And what I want you guys to do is, as a table, you're going to discuss this question. And then you're going to hold up a plicker card based on your answer. So if you look at the, the plicker card, they have an A, B, C, D. Whatever response you choose, you're going to hold that letter up super high. I'm going to give you guys about 20 seconds, and I'm going to scan your answers. So if you choose A, make sure A is at the top of this plicker card. So I have a question, and the question is, what is my challenge for you today? So I gave you a challenge. What was that challenge? Was it A, how do you know that you are creating valid units, learning outcomes, and assessments? Was it B, how do you know that your instruction is meeting the learning objective you have for your students? C, how do you know that your instruction is authentic to students' learning? Or D, none of the above. 20 seconds, as a table, decide what your answer is, and then hold this plicker card up really high. So what is happening right now is I downloaded the Plickers app, and you can print off these Plicker cards. You can actually assign a card to students, too. And then as I take my iPhone across, it's scanning those and collecting data. I'm not supposed to stand in this dark spot, but I'm just going to do it to scan. OK, very cool. So I'm going to ask you another question. And again, I'll give you 20 seconds. The five-step process is also known as what? So I went through a five-step process. What is another way we can call that process? Is it A, being an organized educator, B, instructional alignment, C, backwards design, or D, all of the above? 20 seconds, decide, hold up your plicker cards. <laughs> awesome. You guys don't even know how awesome this is right now. OK, cool. I am gonna, I'm going to pull this full circle at the end, and you're going to see why I just assessed you guys. OK, so we're going back to number three. So I said that I create outcomes. So I go through this process. Number three is creating outcomes. And I'm very, very strategic when I create an outcome. So again, my nitty gritty details. One of the things that I make my best friend is Bloom's taxonomy. And some of you guys may be very familiar with that. Some of you guys may have no idea what this is. Basically what it is is it's a hierarchy of the learning processes or the cognitive demands. And so we start at a very low demand of learning, which is like a remember. Um, very easy to do. It's something like recalling information or doing an identification on information. So identification would be something as simple as TV, table, chair very low demand in the learning, and it can go all the way up to creating. So if you think about a student at the end of their education here at USU, they have all this wonderful information that we taught them. Now they can take that information and create something with it or come up with a new concept or a new idea. So it's basically the level of learning that we go through and the demand on it. So when I create a learning outcome, I, spit, I pick a very specific verb to use. So for example, I teach a horse productions class, and one of the, the learning objectives I have is I can explain basic nutritional needs of a horse. And I was specific with that verb, and the verb being explain. It's a second level on the demand of the cognitive process, so I would assume that there's some remembering or some base information there before they could explain it. So things like what kind of feeds would they need, what do you do to calculate the horse's uh, nutritional needs, and I create all of these outcomes. For this particular course, I actually have 50 outcomes. So 50 learning outcomes that I specifically want my students to learn by the end of the semester, by the end of my course. The next thing that I do is I upload them to, uh, to the Canvas learning system. And by uploading them, and by me, I actually mean City, and I mean Erin's Wadsworth. She did it all for me, all 50 and then some, actually. She's probably done over 200 outcomes for me. But you go into your Canvas, and on the side, you have that Outcomes little tab. Click on it, and then you can create your outcomes. Or you can get City to create your outcomes. I might need a drink of water. <laughs> Anyways, and so you select on Add an Outcome, and you type in there the title of your outcome, and then you put in what your actual outcome is. The other thing that's a little unique about this is you actually have to come up with a mastery learning expectation scale. 
So on there, they automatically give you three. It'll keep running through this. They automatically give you three different types of expectations. I use four. So I use a no mastery, meaning students did not get this concept. I use a near mastery, which means mm, student kind of got the concept without some help from me or from a peer. They're probably not going to do that well on it. They mastered the concept, meaning exactly how I uh, worded my outcome, the students were, ever, were able to meet that. And then the last one, exceeding it. So they could go above and beyond. So if I expected them to explain a basic nutritional need, they probably have the ability to analyze the nutritional need. Based on what that horse is, what it's doing, they can go above and beyond that and create um, a nutritional need, a nutritional schedule for that horse. So. The cool thing is, is I've learned how to make Canvas work for me, which a lot of you guys are probably thinking, I feel like I work for Canvas, right? And so this is where City was very helpful with me navigating through this system. So once I turn, uh, or once I upload my outcomes, I have to go into Canvas and I have to go into my settings, and then I have to go into the references and then turn on a learning mastery gradebook um, not only for me, but for my students. So feature options, and then you'll see a learning mastery gradebook, and you'll see a student learning mastery gradebook, and you need to turn those two things on. And so I go into my Canvas, and I make sure those are on. Okay, so number three, creating my outcomes. This is how I create my outcomes. The next thing I can do is number four, right? I need to create my assessments. How am I gonna know my students know their learning outcomes? And so the great thing is I have them all up on Canvas and I can link them to any kind of assignment, any kind of assessment I give my students. So in this one, I created a rubric. One of the things students have to do is they actually have to perform a writing pattern. So I uploaded all of the learning outcomes that the students were gonna be able to perform on this um, assessment. I put it into Canvas. The students have access to this. They know exactly what I'm going to quiz them on. And then I go into my speed grader with this rubric. I film the students doing the writing pattern. And then I grade them according to this. So each outcome uh, has the ability to be tracked and to be created individually. You can also go in and create question banks that align to an outcome. So in this horse production, remember, I have 50 outcomes. So I go into my Canvas, into Quiz, I click into Manage Question Bank, and I have 50 question banks because I have 50 outcomes. So every single one of these outcomes are aligned into a question bank. So if I need to give a quiz, it's very easy. I've created it all. It's a lot of work up front. I realize that. But now I can just click in and say, okay, what outcome did I just teach today, and what do I want to quiz on? Or if I want to create my midterm and I tell my students it's the, first, it's the first 25 outcomes of this course, now I have somewhere to pull from. And each one of these questions are very specifically aligned to that outcome. Again, if we think about that verb, if I want them to identify, I actually test them on an identification level. Okay? So number four, I create my assessments, I align them to an outcome. And again, I'm using Canvas to work for me. So what happens is um, I create my instruction, I teach the students, and then I assess them. And this is what that learning mastery gradebook looks like. And that's a really nice visual, right? And what happens is that expectation that you set, remember I use four, is color-coded. So red means the students did not learn. They did not meet your expectation. Maybe you have a near mastery, they were close, but without some help, they're not going to get there. Green, my mastery, they got exactly the way I wanted them to get it. They met my expectation. Dark green, they exceeded my expectation. Very cool, right? A really quick way to look at it, and it's a little bit different than the grading scheme of A, B, C, D, because now I'm talking about them learning the concept. I'm talking about the learning expectation, not did they get a C, did they get an A, did they learn the concept? And Canvas will do this for you. This is good, right? This is exciting for us. So when I look at this, I may look down an outcome, and I may say, hey, I got a lot of greens. I'm doing pretty good. My instruction must have been flawless. My students' learning was at the top. But what happens when you get an outcome with a lot of reds and yellows? What does that mean? 
You knew what the outcome was. You created it. You knew what the learning expectation was. You selected your verb very carefully. You created the assessment. You knew how you were going to gauge whether they learned it or not. And you get a lot of yellows and reds. I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds. Talk at your table. What do you think that means? Go. Before I give you the answer, or what I believe in my humble opinion is the answer, I assessed you guys, right? I asked you two questions. So let's take a look at those. My first question was, what is my challenge for you today? Now, really, when I was given this opportunity to be the keynote, one of the biggest things was student learning, right? And then City knows that I'm a little obsessed over this learning mastery, and I'd come from a place where I'd used it before. And so I wanted to challenge you guys on instruction and how it affects student learning. And so when I did this, we actually had only Bs. That's good, right? So not only was my challenge what I wanted you guys to be able to do, I met it and you guys proved you learned it. You knew what I wa wanted you to feel challenged by today. But what about number two? Did this have anything to do with the instruction and its effect on student learning? The five-step process is also known as, does that have anything to do with what my challenge was today? Not really. I don't really care if you know the name of it. I'd like to call it Kelly's process, but that's not what it's called. Uh, if you come from education, it's actually called backwards design, taking the big idea and then working all the way through to your instruction. Um, however, I kind of set up this question in twofold. The other thing is, this is a terrible question. Not only is it a terrible question because it has nothing to do with what I wanted you guys to learn today, but it's a terrible question because look at all the answers. How is that not being an organized educator, right? In my mind, I'm thinking, well, it's backwards design, but it is being organized, right? And it is instructional alignment. That's how we align our instruction. So it really could be all of the above. So I had about half of them, well, about a third B, a third C's, maybe a little more than a third D, so maybe not quite a third. But I had a lot of D's. A lot of B's, a lot of C's, no A's. So, when I see a lot of yellows and reds, maybe it was something like question number two. Maybe I created an assessment full of terrible questions, right? Now, is that fair to make students accountable for a terrible assessment? What if this was a grade today? What if this was part of your promotion or your tenure and you failed half of it? But really, it was a bad question. So maybe it was your assessment. That happens all the time. In fact, Canvas will do an item analysis, if you haven't used it, where you can go through and see how students answered your questions. And there's a lot of insight to that when you see how they start to answer it. But what about the instruction? Did I ever give you guys a name for that? Did I set you up for success? I purposely did that to fail, actually. So I knew what I was doing, but I also can go back and I look at my instructions. So if I see a lot of yellows and reds, it may be a flaw with the assessment. That happens. But I'm going to say there was probably a flaw in your instruction. Did your instruction really set students up to learn? And did it really set them up to feel successful? And this is the wonderful thing about using this system in Canvas. I've used other ones. This is right at our fingertips. City is exceptional at helping you do this, and we all have it. It's a resource right now that we have, not only to create accountability for the students. Your students can look at this. Your midterm's on number 1 through 25. Go look and see where you didn't do really well, and that's what you need to study. But it also creates accountability on my end. How is my instruction going? How are my assessments working for my students? So what can you do? Start small. If this is something, and I challenge all of you guys to consider doing something like this, just start small with a unit. Start with a chapter. Just start by creating one or two learning outcomes. Just start with a few. Start small. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Uh, collaborate. 
we are actually in the process right now in our equine science and management program to collaborate and look at all of our courses and see how they feed into one another and to make sure that our last courses that we are developing the student that we want. Make instruction so that it impacts your student learning. You know at what level you need the students to learn, right? You chose that verb very carefully. Now you know how to enrich it. Maybe they don't really need to explain it, but you can enrich the instruction with that. So now that you are very, very targeted in what you want to teach your students, you now have a big open window on how you're actually going to enrich that, right? Make your instruction a little bit more impactful for the students. Don't lose your excitement. Uh, the first semester I taught here, I had a lot of things going on. I moved to the middle of nowhere. I was out of the competition barn I was in. All my friends lived two hours away. I started here at USU, and my husband deployed to war. Do you think my students knew that? I never lost my enthusiasm, right? That is not their problem, and that is not my job. I don't take out what's going on in my personal life when I'm in the classroom. And then use city. They are an excellent tool for us, and they're here to help us, and they want to help us. But my recommendation is don't use them too much because if they know your name and they think you're doing good things, they might make you the keynote speaker. <laughs> so be careful. And then be dynamic and adaptive, right? I don't know how many times I've gone back and I've looked and I said, you know what, I didn't do a great job. And I'm okay, that's part of that relationship. And I'll go in and I'll show them a test question like, this is a terrible test question, wasn't it? I'm kicking it off. I'm not gonna make you guys responsible for those points. And I also, I can make mistakes. And that's part of that relationship I have with my students. It's okay, I'm human and so are they and they get it. And I have, um, there's this really great, amazing horse trainer and he used this uh, quote um, talking about horseback riding, but I think it works perfectly with education. And the art of teaching is an ongoing and challenging process. One merely strive, one never arrives. And I think that's a great way to look at education and to look at ourselves and the work that we're doing. So I'd like to just leave you with this. We are stewards of our students' learning, and we should take responsibility for that. Thank you.